The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Nora Godwin The Case of the Red Dragon Narrated by Peter Silverleaf At the request of Edward Thompson, who at the time was in charge of the British Museum in London, together with Edward Bond, Holmes and I went to Wales on a beautiful autumn day. We had dealings with Mr. Thompson before, when we were asked to retrieve, and were at least in some part successful, a lost Egyptian mummy. So he turned to Holmes again, with confidence, when he again faced an unpleasant problem. The case in question seemed interesting enough that we took the journey, which took a good part of one day. From London Euston Station we took the west coast line northwest, diagonally through England, via Milton Keynes, Rugby, Coventry, Birmingham, Wolverhampton, and Stafford to Crewe, where we had to change trains. We took a shuttle to Chester to reach the North Wales coast line, which rightly bore its name. Along the Welsh north coast the line continued west, via Rill, Colwyn Bay, Conway and Bangor, where we crossed the impressive Britannia Bridge to the island of Anglesey. While the train was to continue its journey to the final station on Hollyhead, we would get off at the first station on the so-called Island of the Druids. Along the way, Holmes had devoted himself mainly to the thorough study of some books in the field of paleozoology, which had become increasingly popular in recent years. Cope and Marsh fueled the public interest with their continued bone war, bringing the idea of the antediluvian megafauna to the public by positioning realistic prehistoric statues such as in London's Crystal Palace Park, publishing illustrations in newspapers, but also by arranging museum exhibitions with assembled skeletons. Especially the enthusiasm for the so-called dinosaurs, long extinct giant lizards, reached manic to hysterical proportions. All these new found fossils, however, caused the Christian genesis to have a certain need for explanations. I guess that the gigantic prehistoric monsters had simply found no place on Noah's Ark, and therefore drowned miserably in the waves of the flood with their heavy, cumbersome bodies. But joking aside, from a scientific point of view, it was, of course, a milestone to find out about creatures that had populated and undoubtedly dominated the earth for tens of thousands of years, probably even millions of years before the Homo sapiens appeared. But that wasn't the cause for Holmes's newfound interest for these terrible lizards. It had everything to do with our new case. A significant fossil find had been made in a coal mine on Anglesey. The fossilized skull of a dinosaur of a previously unrecorded species. The skull had been preserved as a whole, measuring a remarkable five feet, suggesting an animal up to forty feet long, but the rest of the skeleton remained undiscovered. The pointed, up to twelve-inch-long fang showed the lizard as a carnivore, as a highly dangerous predator of immense size and power. What was found here was probably nothing but the undisputed king of his time, a dominant species that could tyrannically suppress all other living beings. It was a scientific sensation. However, the skull had disappeared overnight from the makeshift location, the church cellar, before being transferred to the British Museum in London. So it was up to Holmes and me to investigate the theft and recover the immense find. 
Of course, we would not have made such a long journey for an ordinary theft, but the question of who stole a dinosaur skull, with what motive and for what purpose, interested us immediately when we were informed of the matter by Mr. Thompson. That's why we quickly made our commitment and set off for Wales to investigate on the ground. And so we found ourselves on the train that just crossed the Menai Strait, which separates Anglesey from the Welsh mainland. Holmes, of course, had no sense for the imposing Britannia Bridge, while I duly paid tribute to this masterpiece of British architecture and engineering. Just across the river, the ninety-foot-tall Doric column of the Marquis of Anglesey was spotted at a distance, commemorating Henry Paget, who led the British cavalry to the Battle of Waterloo and lost a leg. But even for this monument, Holmes did not care about. Nevertheless, crossing over the strait meant that we would soon reach our destination. We're there soon, Holmes, I said, tapping my index finger twice against the back of the book in front of my friend's face. It's time to return to nineteenth-century civilization. Holmes put his book aside and looked at me with displeasure. My dear Watson, he began, this culture here is so much older than ours that we should not boast too much of our present imperial dominance. I was confused and only now noticed that Holmes had already turned away from paleontology. The book that was now lying next to him in the vacant seat was by no means about dinosaurs. It was a Welsh language guide. I picked it up and frowned. Oh, my mistake, I admitted. I thought you were still studying the prehistoric lizards. I finished it after Wolverhampton, Holmes said. I already know everything that the state of research has to offer. And now you are planning to learn the old British Celtic languages? I asked. I mean that language will die out as well as the Mesozoic reptiles which weigh tons. No wonder no normal person can say that. The Welshman is decidedly lacking in vowels. Persistent Y, W, C, H, and nonsensical double consonants, obviously this language comes from the Stone Age and is not suitable for the modern world. Holmes smiled good-naturedly. Maybe, he replied, but stones, precisely megalithic structures and menhirs, actually played an important, probably cultic, role in Celtic culture, but it is exactly this English arrogance, even though you are joking, that will possibly be the end of our road. The Irish, Scottish, and Welsh have every reason to stand by their Gaelic and Cumric roots and resist the Anglo-Saxon Norman influence. I did not know there was a rebellious spirit within you, I replied to continue the amusing banter. You sound like William Wallace, Wolf Tone, and Owen Glendower. Respect is the key to living together in Concord, Holmes said. That's all I am asking for and for the first requirement is to understand the Welsh. I was briefly unsettled and looked at the introduction to the Welsh language which I held in my hand. Uh, but these people, I asked cautiously, uh, they probably understand English, don't they? Certainly, Holmes replied, but the way I see it, you don't understand me, my dear Watson. Meanwhile, the train entered the station. So I ignored my friend's last remark and said, We have to get out. Come on. We quickly grabbed our bags and left the compartment towards the exit. Only a minute later, we were already standing on the platform, while behind us the carriage doors were closed again. With corresponding irritation, I looked at the station sign, which indicated the name of the small town. It read, Hlanfair Pwil Gwynny Gol Gogari Gochin Drob Willanti Silio Gogogoch, or something like that. And of course, it was impossible for me to actually pronounce these fifty eight randomly arranged letters in one word. I pointed to the sign and said, 
Do you see what I mean? Holmes remained unmoved, saying, I see what you mean. Flanfeb win gilgoch goggery gwyn drobby lin tisio gogogoch. This means the Church of St. Mary of the Pool of the White Hazels, over against the Rapid Whirlpool and the Church of St. Tisilo of the Red Cave. They're doing it on purpose, I protested, to annoy us. Well possible, Holmes said, but the locals usually say only Lanfair or Church of St. Mary. I breathed deeply and said, So St. Mary's, the place is simply called St. Mary's. Suit yourself, Watson, Holmes replied with a smile. Rule Britannia. That ended the conversation. I looked around because we were supposed to be picked up from the station. A young student who, on behalf of the British Museum, should have taken care of the unnamed transport of the dinosaur skull to London, should receive us. Finally, we discovered a handsome young man with a black beard who did not look like a budding academic and was unabashedly holding a piece of paper with a capitalized inscription, Holmes in his prank-like hands. We approached the man and Holmes greeted him in Welsh. Rinonda, I'm Sherlock Holmes from London, and this is Dr. John Watson. Latha math, replied the man in Scottish Gaelic, and I immediately realized that the pan-Celtic conspiracy had apparently already begun. But he continued, I don't speak Welsh. I'm from Edinburgh. Follow me. He turned and walked towards a carriage off the platform. Despite his obviously immense physical strength, he showed no signs of wanting to help us with the luggage. And so we walked behind him. We hoisted the bags onto the loading area and sat next to our companion on the front bench. Although it was quite wide, the man's powerful body took half of the bench while Holmes and I had to get along close to each other with the other half. You're late, our new friend growled, before he drove the single horse carriage on. From the train station we immediately reached the main street of the small town, which was of moderate quality. We rode on an uncomfortably bumpy road, past small houses, two pubs and various craft shops. Our coachman proved to be of the more quiet sort, only occasionally he snorted, louder than the horse. Eventually I could not be bothered by this much longer. We have already introduced ourselves, I said. May we know your name? George Edward Challenger, was the terse answer, before the silence took over again, until the carriage came to a halt in front of a church. We are here, proclaimed George, whose statue and aura could be the one of a dragon killer. In this respect it was perhaps quite good that he had not reached out to our hands and squeezed them to greet us. We got off the carriage and I looked at the church, which had only been rebuilt two decades ago in neo-Gothic style, but seemed older since they used quarry stone. The Church of St. Mary, I suspected. You're a very smart man, Mr. Challenger replied mockingly, speaking in full sentences for the first time. No wonder Mr. Thompson is thinking so highly of you and Mr. Holmes. Of course I was not going to tolerate that. Uh, some people at the museum might not be too happy with your work, Mr. Challenger, I noted. What do you mean by that? The alleged student asked, and put on a gloomy look. Well, I answered calmly, after all, you have just lost a unique fossil. On top of that, one of considerable size, it should not have been that easy to lose sight of it. Mr. Challenger slowly approached me, and stood tensely right in front of me. He was at least one head taller than me, and I felt his breath on the top of my forehead. Dr. Watson, he declared in a menacing tone, if you want to offend me, then we should sort this out like men. I had put myself in this situation, so I had to face it. 
"'As you wish,' I replied resolutely, "'and just wanted to start taking off my coat. "'But at that moment I was surprised by an unexpected slap. "'Leave this infantile nonsense,' Holmes commanded. "'While I looked at him in disbelief and rubbing my beaten cheek, he continued, "'Mr. Challenger knows nothing about your black belt in the art of Bartitsu. It is of no use to us if you bring the cocky guy to the ground within two and a half seconds and perhaps break his back. We need to work together as a team. Mr. Challenger, now terrified, walked back three steps and raised his hands as if he wanted to surrender. But Holmes wasn't done yet. He took a step towards him. You should also have a little self-control, young man he said, tapping his right index finger on the mighty chest. Power is useless if you don't know when to use it and when to give it up. So, can we now calm down and cooperate to resolve this case? For all I care, I muttered. And then shake your hands now, ordered Holmes. Like defiant children, Mr. Challenger and I were hesitant to approach each other until we were back within striking distance. But now the dark face of my prevented adversary finally broke loose. He began to laugh in a deep tone and seized my hand, which he immediately pressed vigorously. Well, Dr. Watson, he said, you certainly have courage, and you have to tell me about this probably Far Eastern martial art. Maybe you can teach me something. Uh, certainly, I replied. "'punishing Holmes with a critical side view. "'Then I freed my right hand from the clutch of Mr. Challenger's claw. "'It now felt numb. "'Follow me,' the giant asked us. "'Apparently he also had a gentle side. "'He went towards the church while Holmes and I stopped briefly. "'You know very well,' I whispered to my friend, "'that I have no idea about Bartitsu, but still—' Thank you for saving me. Holmes smiled good-naturedly. No worries, he said. I might still need you in the future. Plus, this guy would undoubtedly have broken all your bones. With these words, he also went towards the church gate, while it was up to me to get our luggage from the car and run after him. At the church, the only one we met was Mrs. Llewellyn, the housekeeper, who was a little older. The priest had just left for a meeting in the Diocese of Bangor. Mr. Challenger explained that Reverend Quinn had provided him with the guest rooms so that he could guard the fossil in the immediate vicinity. Now, the invitation also applied to Holmes and me, although there was nothing more to supervise but only to investigate. The very friendly Mrs. Llewellyn served us a hearty stew with lamb, leeks, potatoes, turnips, and carrots. This dish, called Kol Kimrig, symbolizes as a simple Welsh national dish probably all the simplicity of the country and the population. While Holmes and I were grateful for a little strengthening after a long journey, Mr. Challenger quickly shoveled the food in his mouth. It would not have made a difference for him if he would have eaten the stew with a scoop directly from the pot. Despite the poor manners that were displayed, I tried for a conversation. You're studying in Edinburgh, I began. Yes, Mr. Challenger replied with a half-full mouth. Anthropology and zoology. And how did you get here? I continued. I was already in Wales, Mr. Challenger explained, at Mount Snowdon, on an excursion. Fossil science. And then I received a telegram from London saying that I should make sure that everything went smoothly regarding the transport of the skull. But that did not happen, I added. As far as I am concerned, Holmes interjected, this is just a small delay— we should be able to find a five-foot-long, immensely heavy dinosaur head. Mr. Challenger laughed bitterly. That's what you would like to think, he shouted. But believe me, 
Something strange is going on here. It takes at least three men to carry the skull away. And where? We didn't know where to store it ourselves. That is why we placed him in the basement of the church. Unfortunately, without any security precautions. But who would steal a giant dinosaur bone, for God's sake? I did not think of that. After all, it's a unique relic, I replied. These animals were extinct a long time ago, and most of the skeletons are rotten. Extinct? repeated Challenger, irritated. Don't be too sure, Dr. Watson. If I may add, I replied, science would have probably noticed if the species was still trampling across the planet, wouldn't it? Triceratops will certainly not wander around at Piccadilly Circus, but in appropriate seclusion there is a possibility that some specimen have survived, said Mr. Challenger, unmoved. I looked at Holmes with uncertainty, and then I said, uh, You're not talking about Loch Ness. Nessie might as well be a plesiosaurus, Mr. Challenger said. But no, actually I had more remote ideas in mind. Far from civilization in a forgotten world, perhaps a deserted island in the South Pacific, or an inaccessible valley in the jungle of South Africa, or perhaps a high plateau in South America. Who knows? There are enough unexplored areas on Earth, not to mention the ocean. I certainly hope to discover a live giant reptile one day. Then I can only wish you good luck, I replied. You will need it. Holmes apparently didn't mind such speculation, saying, We'd rather dedicate ourselves to our specimen, of which only fossilized remains prevailed. Was the skull stored below the church, where everyone had access to? Theoretically, yes. Mr. Challenger confirmed. Then we have a lot of suspects, I sighed. A whole small town full of Welsh people. How are we to find our perpetrators? Holmes thought briefly, and then replied, By going to see them, of course. Each and every one of them, I asked. There are probably hundreds of people living here. Yes, everyone, Holmes insisted. I frowned and said, How are we supposed to get in touch with all the inhabitants? By going there, Holmes explained, where they all come together. In church? I suspected, during Holy Mass. But Holmes made a sloppy hand gesture and replied, No, my dear Watson, in the pub, of course. Let's go. With these words, Holmes put his spoon aside, used the napkin and got up. But since Mr. Challenger and I looked at him puzzled and showed no signs of moving, he repeated, Let's go. We're leaving. Whether we wanted or not, we had to submit and follow. And so we joined the night life of St. Mary's in the early evening hours. On the manageable main street were two inns. One, according to the Welsh inscription, I Dragoch Didri Kichwin, or something like that, looked like it had some sort of dragon reference in the name. However, at least the artfully painted sign showing a red and white dragon fighting with each other confirmed my suspicions. The other pub was called a little morbidly Davy Jones Locker, with a sailing ship being attacked by a gigantic octopus. Both seemed to me only partially inviting, but we decided first for the seabed. As it quickly turned out, the landlord was actually called Davy Jones. It felt as if we were in an ethnic comedy. Anyways, he did not surround himself with drowned sailors, but rather with drunken ones. A good twenty men were present and hardly took notice of us. Apparently this inn was the meeting place of the sailors of the city and the surrounding area. Mr. Jones was suspicious of us, saying, You're not cursed land rats, are you? Because if that's the case, you don't get anything to drink here. I stepped forward resolutely and assured, 
Not at all. Rather, water rats. Yes, we are water rats. Uh, for my part, I have already sailed around the Cape, although not entirely voluntarily. Uh, Mr. Holmes has crossed the English Channel several times, only getting seasick once. And Mr. Challenger, as you can see, was already on board with the old Ulysses. He's only on his way to Ithaca. The host started laughing loudly, giving us three glasses of Jamaican rum and saying, I was only kidding. Of course I know who you are. You are the English investigators looking for the lost skull of the Leviathan. The whole city is talking about it. Oh, really? asked Holmes. And what exactly is being said? Mr. Jones pointed to a plaque behind him with chalk numbers written on it. We are taking bets on the case, he said. Three to one that you won't find the skull. Despicable, Holmes whispered to me, then turned to the man behind the bar. I'm putting five pounds on us. And with these words he actually handed the landlord the money. As you wish, Mr. Holmes, Mr. Jones replied, accepting the bet and making a note. And now you are going to tell me, Holmes continued, how do people come to think that we can't recover a lost fossil? The fossil is quite large and has no other value than a scientific one. You can't even sell it on the black market. It would be worthless there. If you ask me, the bartender explained, and you do, I assume the madmen took the skull, and they're going to hide it well. The madmen? I asked. If you mean that. Mr. Jones pointed his right hand through one of the large local windows across the street. These madmen, he replied, are the people from the other inn. They are a little cookie, you know. When the skull was excavated, they claimed it was the head of a dragon. A dragon! That's nonsense, Holmes immediately confirmed. Based on the size of the skull, one can conclude that the animal's body must have weighed at least nine tons. Such a creature would inevitably never be able to fly. The wings would have to have an immense wingspan so that they would not be able to move by pure muscle strength. Not to mention, it is also a question of balance. To make matters short, this is not a dragon. It's nice that you don't believe in fairy tale creatures. I said with a smile. But Holmes simply replied, Of course not, because it is scientifically impossible. The assumed physiognomy and physiology are untenable. Is it too much to ask to invent legends who have at least a minimum of credibility? Exactly. That's what I am talking about. The host surprisingly interjected, They're nuts. They absolutely belong in a madhouse. I've been there, Holmes replied, and I assure you, it's so distressing that you would not wish that on anyone, not even your enemies. But why so much hostility? I interjected. This is a small town. One would like to think that everyone is getting along. Why is the population split into two pubs? Because the others are idiots, if I may add, the host replied. The visitors and supporters of the Red Dragon are mossbacks, bored enemies of progress and anything that characterizes the empire. My guests are ship captains, sailors, merchants, engineers, with a healthy attitude to the wide world whose gates are our ports. The dragon people would like to wall themselves in and socially return to the Middle Ages. Or even further, they even refuse to build the railway station for a long time. I understand, Holmes muttered, putting on his thinking cap. Then he said, Well, let's have a look at those moss men. We drank our rum while Mr. Jones advised, Oh, be careful at all times. You can't mess around with the dragon people. Mr. Jones insisted on inviting us back and would not let us pay for our rum or Caribbean spiritus, as he put it. We then thanked him and left the pub. When we were back on the main road, we immediately turned towards the other pub, which was diagonally across the street. Holmes took the lead and headed to the Red Dragon with determination.
When we entered, I immediately noticed the almost identical furniture. In contrast to the locker, however, we were not ignored by the guests here, but immediately viewed suspiciously from all sides, with the twenty or so men abruptly stopping all their conversations. Nevertheless, we went to the bar undaunted, and the young landlord introduced himself appropriately as George. I have seen you through the window, he said afterwards. You are coming from over there. You are not one of the fish heads, because then you don't get anything to drink here. I quickly stepped forward and replied, Not at all. We are decided land rats. The bartender's gaze remained sinister, but he gave us three glasses of Welsh whisky, albeit wordlessly, and put them on the counter. Dioch. Holmes thanked the locals and took one of the glasses, and the host's face brightened a little. My friend immediately took the opportunity to say, We are here on behalf of the British Museum looking for the lost dinosaur skull. Do you know anything about it? You mean the dragon's head, said George. Before Holmes was able to start a whole discussion about that, I quickly confirmed, Yes, exactly. So you've heard about it? Of course said the landlord, unmoved. But if you ask me, the skull does not belong to an English museum in London. Its place is here in Wales. But the British Museum, I argued, is a museum to all that is British. George spat on the floor behind the counter and replied, unwieldy. Anglo-Saxons and Normans are not British. They are no more than an occupying force from the continent, just like the Romans before. These islands were always Celtic, and they will be again. Mr. Challenger, who had been silent previously, suddenly intervened, declaring, This is a claim that is as daring as it is false. According to the latest findings, the ethnogenesis of the Celtic nations can be established in the Alpine region, based on the Halstatt and Lazio culture. Subsequently, the Celts are believed to have spread to the Iberian Peninsula and the British Isles via France. They too are thus occupiers and have displaced or exterminated an unknown prehistoric, Neolithic indigenous population of Britain. Instantly, a guest jumped up behind us and shouted, What a vicious lie! Quietly, Gareth, the host admonished the young man, who was even a little taller than Mr. Challenger, and whose face was blood-red with anger and short red hair. It's certainly just a bad joke. But no, Mr. Challenger insisted, addressing the somewhat upset guest. Sorry, Gareth, but that's the truth. The Celtic peoples immigrated here, and they originally came from an area that is now in Switzerland and Austria. Uh, they, too, are not absolutely entitled to the British Isles. The young guest approached Mr. Challenger and drew himself up on him, showing off his height in front of the not exactly small student from Scotland. Take that back immediately, he demanded, or do I have to teach your hollow Neanderthal skull a lesson? At that moment of impending escalation, the door opened and Jones, the host of the locker, came in, behind him a considerable crowd of his guests. "'What do you want here?' shouted George, the landlord of the dragon. Behind the counter, "'You are not welcome here. Get out of here, you miserable fish-heads.' "'We just wanted to see if everything was all right in here,' Mr. Jones said. "'There are no problems here, right?' "'I don't know,' Mr. Challenger said. "'smiling arrogantly, looking his red-haired counterpart in the eye. "'What did you call me?' "'Gareth, aware of his physical strength, was not intimidated, "'and replied resolutely, "'A Neanderthal.' "'Oh, really?' said Mr. Challenger, still with a smile on his face. "'Well, then.' "'He turned away, but turned around in a split second "'and punched the young guest in the face, who staggered back but was caught by some of his friends. He shook his head and shouted, As you wished. With these words, he stormed onto Mr. Challenger to start a counter-attack. 
Within a few seconds, the situation got out of hand, as not only Mr. Challenger and Gareth clashed, but also the other guests of the dragon and the newcomers from the locker started to fisticuff. A confusing, wild in brawl broke out, glasses flew through the room and broke, chairs and tables shattered, and their parts were misused as weapons. Most of the opponents, however, fought with bare fists. The two pub owners, George and Mr. Jones, also found each other quickly and started to fight. Holmes and I initially lingered stunned at the counter. But when Holmes noticed that Mr. Challenger was surrounded by four opponents and was in trouble, he said, My dear Watson, it seems to me that our new friend from Edinburgh might need a little help. Would you be so kind? Not really, I replied with a sigh and emptied my whisky. And then I rushed into the fray to support Mr. Challenger, but by then he had striked all four opponents to the ground. Ah, Dr. Watson, he laughed. It's nice that you join us. Your Asian martial arts could be of use to us now. The next moment, a hostile fist hit me on the right temple, and I fell on the side of a table. Immediately, I straightened up again and took aim at my opponent. However, my improvised judo chop against his left collarbone completely missed its effect, so I had to take the next fist coming at me immediately. For God's sake, Watson, now you're finally fighting back, Holmes shouted to me from the counter, who quietly drank his whiskey there. I overcame my slight drowsiness and attacked my opponent with all my artistry in modern fist fights. Three or four blows to the face, and my right hand began to hurt. With a kick against the left lower leg, I brought down my opponent, and he raised his hands, thereby making it clear that he surrendered. I triumphed, looked proudly towards Holmes, but a chair hit me on the back breaking into all its individual pieces. Luckily, it was made of light plywood, so I was only briefly irritated and was able to quickly collect and turn around. But there I saw Mr. Challenger with a surprised face. Oh, forgive me, he said. I confused you in the heat of the battle. But these chairs are useless. How unfortunate. We turned away from each other and looked for our next opponents. The brawl swayed back and forth. Once the dragon people had the upper hand, then the fish heads came back into the offensive. Some, however, have had enough and limped out into the street, counting their blessings. Suddenly, however, an old man stood in the doorway and shouted, For heaven's sake, what is going on here? There stood the local priest, easily recognizable by the clothes he was wearing. Reverend Quinn had apparently returned from Bangor. At that moment, the brawl stopped. The men, who had just attacked each other like berserkers, stood motionless with their heads lowered. They reminded me of schoolboys that were caught in a prank. Eventually, George said, Nothing, there's nothing going on here, father. Just a little discussion among men. The reverend looked around. The restaurant was somewhat devastated. The guests had scrapes, abrasions, and occasionally bloody noses. I understand, said the local clergyman, who looked sharply at his sheep. In this discussion, a few mutton skulls seem to have crashed together, he continued. I expect all of you, without exception, to mass tomorrow. Punctual, clean, sober, peaceful, and repentant. With these words, Father Quinn turned around and left us alone. And in fact, the fighting did not resume. The men, still present, no matter which of the two pubs they came from, put the furniture back up together lifted shards and shards of wood from the floor, and above all they reconciled as if nothing had happened. Gareth took a broom and began to sweep, while the two hosts made peace on a glass of whisky.
Challenger and I went to Holmes, who immediately handed me a handkerchief. Your nose is bleeding, he explained. You have to pay more attention to your defence. Cover with your left. Uh, thank you, Holmes, that's very helpful, I replied, pressing the cloth against my nose from below. Uh, Mr. Jones was right. The people here in the dragon are somewhat cuckoo. But he forgot to mention that this also applies to his guests. Mr. Challenger, for his part, made a cheerful, almost refreshed impression. Good, he said cheerfully. Now we're perfectly integrated. We will be taken seriously from now on. Taken seriously? I asked, annotated, as I tried to control my nosebleed. And what was that? Just a little fun? But no, Challenger replied, smiling. That was great fun. We drank another round of whiskey, to which the host of the dragon gladly invited us. The men, who were still cleaning up, arranged for joint repairs for the next afternoon. After all, some furniture got broken. Next time we meet at your place, George shouted to his colleague from the locker as he finally left the restaurant. Mr. Jones's unexpected and somewhat disturbing response was, My pleasure. And then we too made our way back to the church, or rather to its annexed rooms. The Reverend, tired from the journey, had already gone to bed in the meantime. Mrs. Llewellyn, our quarter host, let us know that we may also show up for Mass tomorrow. She said it would certainly not hurt us. The next morning, Holmes and I had shared a room my friend was already dressed when he woke me up. Get up, Watson, he said, poking my shoulder. It's time for church. My body ached all over, and yesterday's brawl had left its mark. The entire back, especially the posterior shoulder girdle, could not endure any movement. My whole head was buzzing like a wasp's nest. My right cheekbone and nose had suffered a lot, and last but not least, my right punch hand was also sore. There was no doubt that I had hematomas everywhere, all over the rest of my body. I'm afraid I can't get up, I replied in a wry tone. I'm in serious pain. Should I get a doctor? asked Holmes mockingly, or rather the priest. That's not funny, Holmes, I replied grumpily. You didn't have to get involved in the Red Dragon, and you're the one with the martial arts skills. Not in my good set of clothes, Holmes said. Oh, no, I used the time to think while you and the locals were attacking each other like primeval barbarians, and there was no difference between supposedly primitive Welsh and cultivated Englishmen, but only on the margins. We will talk about my findings later. Now, we have to go. Come on. Holmes turned around and left the room. I slowly straightened up, which my bones didn't exactly appreciate. Nevertheless, I forced myself to leave the bed in pain. I left it at a rather superficial morning toilet because even the contact with water was not conducive to my various bruises. So I dressed and limped into the kitchen. At the small table there, Holmes sat down for breakfast that Mrs. Llewellyn had prepared for us before she and Mr. Challenger had gone to church. The Reverend had also gotten busy preparing already. Holmes left me just a few minutes for a cup of tea and a few bites of toast. Even chewing caused me pain. And then we too went to the church to enter it through the main gate. I felt exhausted. In fact, a good part of the residents had gathered. All the men of yesterday's brawl had appeared dutifully. Some showed clear bruises on their faces, others limped, others were only able to drag their maltreated bodies slowly towards the entrance. 
and many of them were accompanied or even driven by women with strict eyes and little understanding, some wives, some mothers. Mr. Challenger, seemingly completely free of serious consequences of the beating, stood next to the gate and chatted animatedly with his original opponent the previous day, the tall, red-haired young man named Gareth. Apparently the two were best friends now. We nodded at them and went on to the inside of the church. The benches were already filled and Reverend Quinn was already standing at the front of the altar. When he saw us, he waved us to sit in the front. Inevitably, we had to follow the priest's wishes and sit in the front row. After a minute, Mr. Challenger joined us just before the sermon began. I do not want to repeat here all the words the Reverend, which in the meantime seemed a little long-winded, said only that much. He quoted from the Sermon on the Mount, and that you should turn the other cheek. It was about peace, brotherhood, and hospitality. Now that we have our visitors from London among us, the priest reprimanded his male listeners, do you really have nothing better to do than to serve the most banal prejudices about our country? Do we really have nothing else to offer to the world than aggressive drunkards and pub brawls? No, this is not the God-pleasing, pious people of Wales that I believe in. And theft isn't right either. The gentlemen from London are looking for the most archaic skull, and all of you who know about it are called upon to help. And now, let us pray. The Mass finally ended with the collective prayer. I would not have endured it much longer on that wooden bench anyways. Afterwards we found ourselves in the living room of the Reverend. As we were already sitting for tea, Gareth came by again and, almost as an excuse for yesterday's argument, brought us a box-shaped loaf, Barra Brith, the typical Welsh fruit bread with raisins and dried berries. Thanks to my sister, said the Reverend, before Gareth left us. Then he turned to us. You already met my nephew, Gareth. He's a good boy, just a little bit unpredictable sometimes. Your nephew, repeated Holmes, raising an eyebrow. How interesting. But don't worry, Father. Perhaps our performance last night was a little too provocative. We apologize for that. But the priest made a defensive hand gesture and replied, Nonsense! The men from the dragon and the locker always find a ridiculous excuse for a beating. This happens almost weekly. In fact, I even discussed this issue with the bishop, and we have an idea. The men lack a balance. To blow off some steam and a sporting activity could offer this. We have therefore decided to form two teams and let the two groups compete against each other on the field with set rules. Are you thinking cricket? I asked. Or football? Neither, the Reverend Quinn replied. Cricket is a bizarre pastime for the bored upper class no one will care about that here. Football is a game for gentlemen with all due respect. My flock needs something else. No, we're thinking more about rugby. It is the right sport for hooligans and the right sport for whales. But we should rather talk about the theft of the skull, shouldn't we? It would mean a lot to the British Museum, Challenger said, to preserve the skull, and to me, of course, after all, it is probably a previously unknown species of a dinosaur. Or a dragon, I jokingly interjected. Don't laugh, Dr. Watson, said Reverend Quinn immediately. The Bible also knows monsters that are generally understood as dragons. But I am not responsible for zoology, and when we talk about dragons here in Wales, it is, of course, about mythological monsters. Both evolutionary theory and church doubt that they are real, and I hope that we will soon overcome that old Celtic superstition. After all, 
the twentieth century is about to begin. My words exactly, Holmes said, pulling a small piece of crumpled paper out of his pocket. How is your Welsh, father? Impeccable, I would say, was the answer. Excellent, Holmes muttered, handing the note to the reverend. I found this leaflet in the Red Dragon while everyone else was involved in the brawl. It is probably announcing a rather exclusive meeting, but it is written in Welsh. Can you translate that? The priest first read the headline. The Red Dragon advances in the name of our fathers. Then he studied the note and began to shake his head violently. These ungrateful simple slobs, he exclaimed angrily. Do you know what that is? This is the call for a secret pagan ceremony to be held in the forest tonight. Inconceivable! In the morning they come to Holy Mass, and then in the evening they organize some druid hocus-pocus. Only one missing is Merlin the Magician. An old Celtic druid ceremony, Holmes repeated slowly. It is quite possible that this has something to do with a dragon skull. We should look into this. Do you know where exactly this event is planned? Of course, confirmed Reverend Quinn. It is the forest clearing with the old meniers that form a semicircle there. I will take you there personally, for I certainly do not allow such pagan blasphemy in my church. We spent the day without ostentation. I tended to my wounds, Mr. Challenger helped with necessary carpentry work in the dragon, and Holmes devoted himself to chemical issues using his travel laboratory. Finally, he produced three cans of powdered contents and two small torches, although I was not sure how these should help us later. So I took one of the torches, the one labelled blue, in my hand, and looked at it in detail. Finally, I asked, What is this? A blue torch, Holmes replied. Yes, I replied, but what does it do? Holmes looked at me and said, It glows blue. At this very precise information, I avoided asking him about the other torch, which was labelled red. Nevertheless, it was clear to me that Holmes had made two torches which burned down with a certain astonishingly intense flame coloration due to certain metal additives. In fact, I had already heard of this invention. It probably originated from India because it was called Bengalian fire. Undoubtedly, these chemical mixtures would cause explosions highly toxic at that and would magically tame dragons, or maybe something of the like. We met again with Mr. Challenger and the Reverend for a slightly premature dinner and a meeting concerning our plans. Mrs. Llewellyn served Welsh rabbit, but I was quickly disappointed when I realised uh, that this dish had nothing to do with rabbits or rabbits. In fact, it was completely meatless. In the end, it was nothing more than cheese toast, prepared with local cheddar with the addition of light Welsh beer. Slowly, and with the help of their cuisine, I started to understand the land, the people, and their fate. All Welsh dishes were simple, made from simple ingredients or leftovers, the historical result of a poor, regularly starving population to which English noble landowners had often withheld the necessary food for a comprehensive diet. The Welsh reacted with ingenuity, sufficiency, and a remarkable sense of humour in naming their comparatively poor food. At this point I would like to refer to the pickled seaweed, which is known as Welsh caviar. What became clear to me, however, was that England had in fact accumulated a considerable amount of historical guilt towards the Welsh people, and even now we are, with our excessive, insatiable industry, 
mainly interested in the coal and other mineral resources stored in the Welsh soil. But back to our case. Holmes had developed a plan that would allow us to approach the secret gathering in the forest carefully and unnoticed, and observe it so that we would receive essential information. Reverend Quinn, for his part, was determined to stop the pagan ceremony, but agreed to submit to Holmes's instructions. And so all four of us went to the forest. Of course, we did not turn on our Bengali torches, because they were veritable beacons and intended for a different situation. Instead, we contented ourselves with the light reflected by the full moon, which was enough to prevent us from stumbling over towering roots or our own feet. After a quite arduous walk of certainly twenty minutes, of course we could not use the normal and more comfortable path, we reached the edge of the said clearing, where we hid behind a large but otherwise completely free-standing hazelnut bush and watched the events in front of us. And what we got to see was a remarkable surprise. A good thirty men in dark cows and hoods, full deep in their faces, had gathered inside the stone semicircle for their secret meeting. Torches had been rammed into the ground, which illuminated the clearing halfway. In the middle of their meeting, the men had set up a wooden table, a druid altar. Laying on top was our lost dinosaur skull. Apparently it was part of the ceremony to worship the supposed dragon head with everything taking place in Welsh. They have the skull, Mr. Challenger whispered impatiently. We should go and get it. Hold your horses, Holmes replied. All in good time. We do want to see what happens next. Mr. Challenger complied, but not without grumbling, and our eyes were again focused on what was happening in the clearing. Eventually I could see two faces under the hoods, and immediately pointed it out to Holmes. There are the two bar owners, I remarked quietly. They have been working together the whole time, and are obviously at the forefront of this conspiracy. In fact, Mr. Jones and George apparently took a central position at the ceremony, as they were right at the improvised altar, they were probably the modern druids. Suddenly Mr. Jones pulled up a long knife to the audible delight of the other men. Then another man stepped into the clearing, and to the reverend's regret it was his nephew Gareth. He dragged a young sheep and approached the altar. Apparently the poor animal should now be sacrificed to a Celtic deity or the dragon's head. Now was the perfect time for an intervention. Holmes nodded to Challenger and me, and we both lit the Bengal torches, left and right of the mighty hazel bush, and put them in the ground. Immediately they started glowing and sparkling in blue and red colour, a colourful fog laid over the clearing as we hid behind the bush again. Immediately there was unrest in the stone circle, because the men did not know what was going on here. But before they could come up to us and look, the reverend emerged from our hiding place, raised his long wooden crucifix, and began to shout loudly, reciting from the Bible, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of thy fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And while the reverend preached to the irritated Celts, 
it was time for Holmes' next dramatic step. He poured two of his chemical containers over the hazelnut bush, asked us to back up and threw a firewood into the bush. In a split second, the wood lit up in flames like a lightning bolt that was shooting the fire to the sky. Reverend Quinn took a slow, unwavering step onto the clearing where the surprised men stood. Behind him, the light-burning bush provided a sharpening theatrical appearance in the name of God. At the same time, the priest continued his gloomy sermon. And I will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger those who attempt to poison and destroy my brothers, and you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. The men, meanwhile, stood in a brightly lit clearing and knew that they had been found out by Reverend Quinn. Soon the first one, then the second, took off. Finally everyone made a run for it, and even Gareth dropped the sheep and ran away. Left behind was the abandoned stone semicircle of the Celtic monoliths, and in the middle of it was our dinosaur skull. The priest turned to us and shouted, Come out, gentlemen, I think we have sufficiently proven whose God is more powerful. We have prevailed in the name of the Lord. And then he said, Let us get rid of the golden calf, while he was pointing at the antique skull. Mr. Challenger immediately made his way back to the city to get the church's horse-drawn carriage, which we used to retrieve the skull. Holmes, meanwhile, poured the contents of his third container into the burning bush, and in fact the fire was immediately extinguished as if by magic. The old Merlin would have enjoyed such chemical tricks. We kept an eye on the surroundings until Mr. Challenger returned, and then we loaded our skull under considerable effort and slowly rolled back towards the church. When we got there, Jones, George and Gareth already welcomed us as repentant sinners. They retreated with the reverend to the church hall, who would certainly teach them a lesson. We brought the recovered skull back to the basement, and Mr. Challenger kept watch all night for safety but a new Celtic conspiracy in favour of Druid ceremonies could no longer be assumed. So Holmes and I went to bed, both content and relaxed. The next day we deservedly said goodbye to Lanfair Pwil Gwyn Gilagorogoch Crin Dod Drob Dwilantri Silagoch Goch Goch. Reverend Quinn, who was sure he had brought his Celtic sheep back to the Christian line, accompanied us to the train station, where Gareth and three of his friends helped load the skull into a sealed wagon, which would not be opened until London. Nevertheless, Mr. Challenger felt responsible for the skull. And that is why he would not leave its side, and even had himself sealed in inside the wagon. In addition, as he had told us at the time of our departure, Challenger wanted to propose to the British Museum uh, that the dinosaur find, after a thorough scientific study, of course, should only exhibit in London from time to time. In fact, as we later heard, he was able to arrange that the supposed skull of the Red Dragon of Wales was also presented to the public at times in Bangor, Carnarvon, and in his home, Anglesey, in the coming months. Holmes and I spent the return journey in comfortable compartments which I had earned. The physical consequences of the brawl in the Red Dragon finally became apparent all over my body, and every movement I made was accompanied with a pain-filled moan. Well, you know, my dear Watson, Holmes scoffed, why the Romans had trouble subjugating the Welsh, and why the Anglo-Saxons and Normans fared little better? Don't worry. I replied. I learn my lesson. You will no longer hear a derogatory word from me about the Welsh, about their culture, their language, and their spirit of resistance. And by the way, not about their peculiar but excellent whisky either. Holmes smiled good-naturedly. I am happy to hear that, he said. Then our trip to Wales was at least not completely useless. What do you mean? I asked, confused. Oh, you know, Holmes said with a playful thought, if I think about it correctly, 
The Reverend Quinn and Mr. Challenger might have found the skull again without our help, at least sooner or later. I frowned. Really? But Holmes began to laugh. But no, he laughed. They are dilettantes. Without us, they would have been lost. I don't know, I muttered. It seems to me that Mr. Challenger is a capable, visionary, and courageous young man. He could make something out of himself. Perhaps we should put in a word for him at Mr. Thompson's. Assuming he finishes his studies in Edinburgh successfully, he could be a valuable asset to the scientific staff of the British Museum in the future. He would probably be the right man to lead expeditions to unknown areas. Possibly, Holmes replied. Who knows? Perhaps one day, when Mr. Challenger is a professor, he will actually find dinosaurs living somewhere in their forgotten world.'